Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Praminda Jita and I'm the product manager for the SAC suite of programs. And today's tech talk is on the fatigue uh, of offshore structures. Okay, to begin with, uh, during the life of a, any offshore structure, it's exposed to a variety of, of environmental and operating load conditions. Some of these are not cyclic, for example, gravity loads, live loads, while others such as wave and current and deck-mounted uh, rotating equipment and also vortex shedding, ice loading are cyclic and these may result in fatigue damage. As you all know, fatigue is a result of many repeated loads. Therefore, the daily action of wave and currents results in a large number of load cycles which are responsible and may lead to fatigue failure. In frequent cyclic loads resulting from extreme events such as storm waves, storm waves are really not very significant because they occur so seldomly. In addition, wind may also be uh, cause significant fatigue damage uh, and basically we check these for cylinder structures such as flare booms or a bridge which may connect different platforms. In areas where there, there are significant sheets of ice flow, fatigue from ice loading may also be significant uh, in that the ice sheets result in cyclic loads during the failure process while interacting with the structure. And these essentially produce a sore type of a load time history, sawtooth. The flow of uh, fluid past the structural member, such as a cylinder, can also result in vortex shedding, leading to vortex-induced vibrations. And this can also lead to fatigue damage. Apart from vortex shedding, SACS has the ability to predict damage from all of these sources of loading. Uh, for the, today's talk, we will not have time to cover all of these topics, so we will basically concentrate on the most common type of fatigue analysis in the offshore industry, which is fatigue damage induced from wave and current loading. Uh, we will leave the other topics to a, a future tech talk. Uh, we'll begin first by looking at some basic concepts. First, how does fatigue failure occur? Uh, fatigue failure occurs when micro cracks develop and grow until the material fra fractures. Uh, such cracks are likely to occur in flaws or inclusions in the material, especially at points of abrupt changes in geometry of the structure, resulting in stress concentrations. Fatigue damage itself is defined by the number of stress cycles for a particular stress range divided by the allowable number of stress cycles for that stress range. For a structure subject to different stress ranges, the total damage can be assumed to be the sum of damages from each stress range. This accumulation of damage is known as the Pelmgren Miner's Rule, also just Miner's Rule. And, it, and basically forms the basis of all fatigue damage calculations. Uh, fatigue failure is assumed to occur when the total damage reaches one. Next, looking at fatigue life, the fatigue life is determined by the time taken for the total damage to reach a value of 1.0. If the fatigue life is calculated, say, over X number of years, as shown here, then the life can be determined uh, determined by x uh, divided by the total damage. For an offshore structure, if the damage is calculated over the life of the structure, then the life can be expressed by the de uh, design life divided by the total damage over this period. To calculate the fatigue damage for a particular stress range, the allowable number of stresses, stress cycles can be obtained from uh, any published ascent curve. The limiting stress range value, uh, stress range below which no damage can occur is known as the endurance limit. SACS has a whole 
array of SN curves available for fatigue calculations, and these include those from API, Health and Safety Executive, American Welding Society, NORSOC, ISO, and the users can also define or input their own SN curves. For an offshore structure, well, welded joints are particularly susceptible uh, to fatigue failure, largely because the area around the welds is subject to sharp discontinuities, which results in higher stress. Uh, stress is also, these are termed, stress concentrations. The small defects present in the wells, uh, which can also, uh, can also uh, act as crack initiators. Also, the residual stresses resulting from weld uh, as it cools and solidifies can also contribute to fatigue. Next, looking at stress concentrations. Uh, a stress concentration, which is also referred uh, commonly as a hot spot stress, is determined by multiplying the nominal stress, which is the stress well away from the joint, uh, with the stress concentration factor. The stress concentration factors for various types of joints may be determined by models or FE, uh, finite element analysis. For tubular joints, there are many SCF approaches uh, which are available in SACS, including those by Themu, Quang and Wordsworth, Smedley and Fisher, Marshall, and DNV. Uh, most offshore codes now recommend TAMU uh, as the standard approach. Let me start this off. For non-tubular joints uh, commonly found in top sides, uh, especially top sides of floating structures, uh, SACS is developing an automatic uh, meshing capability for SCF extraction. Release 11.0 saw the introduction of joint mesh uh, graphical user interface, which allows the user to quickly add stiffening plates to any joint, automatically mesh it, and insert the mesh joint back into the beam model, as shown here. The mesh joint is automatically connected to the beam elements uh, using rigid offsets. The new user interface allows the user to add arcs, arc transitions, straight lines uh, for modeling stiffening plates. The user has also has full control of the overall mesh density and the meshable length of each members composing the joint. Here we, adding a, we are adding a gusset plates, and the user can uh, delete unwanted uh, lines here quickly. And once the plates have been defined, you simply click on a button to say mesh the joint, and the joint is automatically meshed. And as, as I said, it's inserted back in, into the beam model automatically. It, inserting it back into the beam model ensures that you have full compatibility between the mesh and the rest of the structure. In other words, usually these type of Meshes are uh, developed in a third-party software such as Abacus or ANSYS. And when you do this, the boundary conditions uh, which would connect the mesh to the beams can either satisfy forces or displacements, but not both. In this case, by inserting the whole mesh back into the beam model, we ensure that both forces and displacement conditions are satisfied. The stiffening plates can be external or internal, uh, as shown here, such as ring stiffeners. Uh, the upcoming SACS 12-point release uh, will also provide the user the capability to automatically extract SCFs after the structure has been analyzed. And we will also provide the capability to generate plots of the SCFs around the footprint, say, of each member uh, in the joint. Uh, talking to engineers who are involved in the de design of top sides on floating platforms such as FPSOs, 
we have indicated that up to 40% of the time can be spent on producing detailed finite element models of non-tubular uh, stiffen joints, mainly for SEF determination. Therefore, this meshing capability that we are uh, providing with SAC will allow for major time savings on projects. In addition to this, this capability does away with the need to produce these detailed finite element models in other software such as ANSYS, Abacus, or Nastran. In other words, the whole analysis can be conducted entirely in SACS. Uh, we do have a question regarding this. Uh -huh. um, whether or not they are 2D or 3D elements that are generated. Um, and then another one asking about solid elements, so pretty much the same question there. These are currently basically 2D elements. In other words, they are plates, plated elements. Uh, after we have completed the S automatic SCF extraction capability, we will extend this capability to include both curved shell elements and solid elements. Uh, and I know the solid elements are a requirement, uh, especially for some users who also want to model the actual weld itself. So our first step is to actually give you the capability to automatically extract SCFs uh, from meshed models using plate elements. Uh, the plate elements that we use in SACS are the DKT plate elements, which are have been proven or have been tested against standardized um, uh, methods, uh, and, and these are actually available on the community sites. So the elements have been validated uh, and are and compare very well with other elements in other software outside an industry. Okay, so. There are three common, uh, uh, hopefully that answers that question. There are three uh, common approaches available in SACS for fatigue analysis uh, resulting from wave loads. Uh, and these are deterministic, uh, spectral, and time history fatigue. And the first step of any fatigue analysis, whether it's spectral or deterministic, is to determine if you should consider dynamic effects. Uh, and this can be determined by running the SACS DynePack program to determine the natural periods. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, it's usually recommended that dynamic effects should be considered if your natural period is greater than 3 seconds or the water depth is greater than 400 feet. Uh, we'll look at deterministic fatigue first. Deterministic fatigue, uh, the fatigue uh, for this the fatigue environment is based on a discrete set of waves of varying heights and periods together with their occurrence data. Uh, stress concentration factors are then uh, used to determine the hotspot stress range for each wave. Each hotspot stress range, uh, for each hotspot stress range, an SN curve is used to find the allowable number of cycles for that stress range. Finally, uh, the program will use Miner's Rule, uh, as we discussed earlier, to predict the damage uh, and the damage life of that fatigue joint. Uh, the deterministic fatigue has been in the past shown to produce reliable results uh, for what we call dynamically insensitive structures and also for fatigue waves with long periods. This approach does not account for the full distribution of energy over the entire uh, frequency range and of course it's very sensitive to, se to the selection of waves and the corresponding periods. It's mainly used in areas where there is uh, no available spectral data. This is a typical example of deterministic wave data. and Basically, it's comprised, it comprises of uh, wave heights here and the occurrence uh, for each different direction. In this case, we have four directions. Uh, looking at fatigue load cases, in SACS, each uh, direction is considered as a separate fatigue load case. 
So if you're looking at eight directions, which is a typical for offshore, uh, SACS will consider this as eight fatigue load cases. Now in SACS you can run this all in one analysis, in which case uh, you will produce one common solution file, or you can run these separately as for each direction, in which case you will produce multiple common solution files. Uh, next, looking at spectral fatigue, uh, a random C state in, t in the time domain, this is shown here, uh, can be represented by a number of sinusoidal waves uh, using a Fourier series expansion. So in other words, you can break up any, any sort of random wave into a number of discrete uh, sinusoidal waves. Once you do this, a wave spectra uh, in the frequency domain, and we're looking at the frequency domain in this direction, uh, can be uh, generated by plotting the square of the amplitudes for each of the sinusoidal wave components against the, uh, either the frequency or the period. And for those of you who are familiar with, familiar with electrical engineering, uh, uh, they define power as a function of the square of the amplitude. And therefore, the wave spectra is also sometimes referred to as the power spectral density. So if you hear one of these, it's basically talking about the wave spectra. The types of wave spectra available in SACS are the Pearson Moiskowitz, John Swap. Uh, the Pearson Moiskowitz is typically used in the Gulf of Mexico and Asia. The John Swap spectrum is typically used used in the North Sea. And we also have the Ochi Hubble spectrum, which is commonly used off the west coast of Africa. And of course, the user can put in uh, their own spectrum. Uh, the Ochi Hubble spectra is a, uh, is a spectra that is, is a special type in that it's twin peaked. Uh, the component of spectra with the lower frequency peak corresponds to the remotely generated swell waves, and the one with the higher frequency is normally uh, corresponds to the local uh, wind-generated waves. OK, so without going into too much theory, uh, here is an overview of the basis behind the spectral fatigue, uh, a spectral fatigue analysis. Uh, for a spectral fatigue, uh, the stati statistical stress range, sigma RMS, is a function of the power spectral density and the tra uh, transfer function. So for a particular value of sigma RMS, we can find the allowable number of stress cycles uh, from the ascent curve. Similarly, we can use the zero crossing period uh, which is also a function of the wave spectra uh, to calculate the number of occurrences for this particular stress range. And then the damage associated uh, with this particular stress range can be calculated by dividing the number of occurrences of the RMS stress range by the allowable number of occurrences uh, uh, times the probability of this stress, stress range occurring. Since we know the type of wave spectrum to use, the only unknown here is the transfer function. So for a spectral fatigue analysis, the majority of the effort, uh, the analysis effort, goes into defining the transfer function. So how do we calculate or define the transfer function? Basically, a transfer function represents the dynamic characteristics of the structure when subject to two waves from diff of different periods and heights from different directions. It's uh, unrelated to the fatigue, uh, waves that cause the fatigue, and people often confuse the two. The waves used to determine a transfer func function, cannot, you cannot just choose them arbitrarily, and these are limited to waves of given steepness value applicable to the geographical location of the structure. And steepness here is defined by the wave height uh, 
divided by the wavelength. And typical values for steepness are 1 over 15, 1 over 20, uh, or 1 over 25. To determine the transfer function at a given location on a joint in the structure, a wave of a given period or frequency is, is stepped through the structure. And we analyze the structure at each, uh, at each step. And then what we do is we record the maximum stress range and we divide that by the wave height and we plot it against the period or, or frequency. Uh, the pro this process is repeated for waves of different periods or frequencies, of course, uh, with the same steepness. Uh, to determine the transfer function on all location, uh, say if we were doing this uh, properly around each joint in the structure, is a really a considerable task and will take a long time. To get around this, the standard practice is to develop a transfer function which corresponds to either the base shear or the overturning moment. So when one is determining the transfer function, uh, care must be taken in choosing the waves so that all the troughs and the peaks are accurately captured as these are the ones that have big impact on the fatigue life of the joint. And commonly speaking, uh, around, we choose many waves around the natural period of uh, the structure and less uh, as we go further away from it. But you have to plot that transfer function, look at the quality, uh, and ensure that you're satisfied with it before conducting a, fatigue, a spectral fatigue analysis. Otherwise, your results uh, are going to be out. OK, so moving on to time history fatigue analysis. Uh, for a time history fatigue, the wave is usually expressed as a random surface profile over a, a given time period uh, t. Uh, the random surface profile can be either obtained directly from on-site measurements uh, or generated from wave spectrum. If you're generating the time history from a wave spectrum, what we do here is we subdivide the spectrum into discrete frequency bands, as shown here, and then using an airy wave which represent each, represents each frequency and with a random phase angle, uh, then what we do is once we've done that, we add all these waves, combine all the airy waves to generate your random surface profile. Uh, so once you have your random surface profile, uh, we perform a full-time history analysis on the structure. And the analysis results are output at given time intervals, T1, T2, T3, which can be defined in the wave response package in SACS. Once we have these uh, results at these time intervals, then we basically use something called the rainflow counting algorithm uh, to reduce the varying stresses uh, calculated at each time point into a set of stress ranges, and a number of cycles uh, to calculate damage at any location on a connection. Basically, we have we produce buckets of various stress ranges, and, and we know the uh, occurrence of these, uh, the number of occurrence for each, and basically use this to do your uh, damage calculations. Ravinder, I've got a question for you here. Um, what will be the duration of the time history? Is it three hours? Typical. Three to four hours uh, is typical for an offshore structure. For uh, the, the time history fatigue analysis is very typical for the offshore wind turbine type of structures, in which case they use 10 minutes. But in that case, they can use up to 3,000 to 5,000 time histories, so a lot of time histories. Uh, but yeah, typically three to four hours, I, I've seen that. OK, so the, uh, looking at the rainflow stress cycle counting, uh, there are different variants of this approach. 
the ones that is, the one that is used in SACS, uh, it's recommended by the American Society for Testing and Materials, where the basically the largest cycle is extracted first, and then you assume the smaller cycles are considered to be superimposed on, on the larger cycle. Okay. Next, looking at the analysis workflow uh, for a dynamic fatigue analysis. Uh, this slide shows uh, the workflow in SACS, uh, whether it's a spectral, deterministic, or a time history fatigue analysis. Basically, the workflow is similar for all the, all, all the analysis types I've mentioned. Uh, for a fixed platform, usually the first step is to linearize the foundation. Uh, for a, su a subsequent model analysis. In other words, you need to linearize the foundation so you can do a model analysis. A model analysis is a linear analysis, and therefore you cannot use a nonlinear foundation. To do this, we the PSI module is used to generate a full, fully coupled uh, super element representing the pile foundation. In other words, this is a matrix, uh, so fully coupled matrix. And we use this to represent the behavior of, of the pile, pile foundation. Uh, the super element is then used to conduct a, a modal analysis using the SACS DynePack module. And this will output a file uh, containing the mode shapes and, and the mass matrix. Uh, these files are then used to conduct a wave response analysis. Uh, and for a spectral fatigue analysis, the, the wave response analysis is basically is what we use to generate a transfer function. So when you're generating these common solution files, you're basically generating your transfer function. So once you have the common solution files, uh, then these are used to conduct a fatigue analysis of the structure. Uh, and the fatigue module can output the results uh, from any critical joint exceeding a, a user-defined maximum uh, damage into what's called uh, an extract file used by interactive fatigue. Now, as I said before, uh, you can treat each uh, SACS you, uh, treats each fatigue direction as a fatigue load case. So if you have eight directions, uh, you can either run them all in a single run and produce a single common solution file or run each separately and produce eight separate common solution files. Uh, the SACS interactive module, and I'm going to sh show you that now, uh, is basically uh, this, this slide shows the, excuse me, this slide shows some of the post-processing functionalities. Uh, of the SACS interactive fatigue module. Uh, in other words, the first step is to here is to import the extract file into Proceed by using the import uh, fatigue option under the joint menu. All the joints that are included, uh, in, including the inline joints in the extract files, are then highlighted in the module in the model itself. You can then use the properties option under the joint menu, and this will highlight the fatigue results for each joint. Uh, you can, as you can see, a tree structure for each critical joint is produced on the left-hand side of the screen, where each joint is color-coded depending on the damage level, uh, as shown in the legend. Each joint in the tree structure can be expanded to show color-coded members connected to that joint. And the user can click on each member to display the code and the brace details, such as geometry, fatigue design, uh, life safety factor, SN curves for, for that fatigue calculation. The fatigue results tab uh, down here uh, can be used. It shows the SCF values for the various locations around the brace and the code. And the damage levels are on the eight locations on both the cord side and the brace side of the footprint. And also including the maximum damage and the location of the maximum damage on that joint for the particular joint. Uh, the user can get the same information 
by actually clicking on the members uh, itself in, in the model. Uh, for interactive redesign, the user can change parameters such as the geometry, SCF approach, uh, the SCF approach being used, the SN curve being used, and the program will uh, uh, instantaneously uh, output the damage and the new design life corresponding to those changes. Each change that you make is highlighted in bold. And of course, the user can uh, revert back to the original values by clicking on the Reset Changes uh, button at the top here. Uh, the program can also be used uh, to output a variety of plots, for example, such as damage, uh, wave spectrum, or, dam or damage wave spectrum transfer function, etc. In addition, the actual interactive fatigue module has the ability to generate a large number of reports which are not output in the list file when you run run fatigue. So it's it's actually very useful for generating design reports afterwards. The with the 11.0 release or 10.0 release, we actually extended the fatigue uh, interactive fatigue module to time history fatigue analysis. So for instance, if you are doing uh, designing a wind turbine structure, which can involve up to 3,000 time histories, you can quickly go in, uh, once you've done your analysis, you quickly go in and redesign that joint for fatigue without having to rerun uh, 3,000 time, uh, time history. So it's a considerable time saver and a great tool for producing uh, results for uh, your design reports. OK, so that basically brings us to the end of this session. Let's go into the question and answer se session. All right, uh, let's see. We'll start from the top. Uh, we had one question asking, uh, can we show SN curves in SACS for a particular joint? I think that was answered at the very end in the interactive fatigue presentation. Sure. Correct. SN curve per joint. And actually, in an interactive fatigue, you can change the SN curve uh, interactively, too. So. Yeah, for example, if you find that joint is failing, and you might want to profile the welds, which uses a different SN curve, you can go ahead and do that in interactive fatigue, and then assess what effect it's going to have on the fatigue life. Here we have a question about uh, the joint measure. It says, what are the element size around the area of the hot spot, and can the user control the mesh size, uh, particularly for non-tubular joints? Correct. The user has uh, complete control of the mesh density at the intersection between various members and you can set it to a small number in which case uh, you can get element sizes which are up to or below the thickness of the uh, tube uh, this uh, the section itself sorry what was the other question oh they were just asking particularly for non tubular joints so right this is this goes for any, any type of joints yes and you also have the complete control of the measurable length of each member as well. So you can control the density at the intersection uh, of each member and away from the member as well. So you can have a very fine mesh where you have the intersection and a coarser mesh uh, away from the intersection. Uh, here we have a question. Is SCF and stress reduction factor the same? Uh, I don't know when you would uh, ever I, reduce the stress. <laughs> yeah. The SCF is a stress concentration factor, in which case what you do is you get the nominal stress and you multiply the nominal stress to re increase the stress at that point, in other words. So it's not it's the same as a reduction factor. And I, I don't know either when, we, when you would reduce the stress itself. I suppose you if you are applying some sort of stress reduction factor, you could incorporate that into your stress concentration factor, you know, modify it before you input it, because it would be 
in theory, just multiplying a factor on the nominal stress. So um, you could you could do it both ways, I guess. Let's see, are there learning resources, training videos, or tutorials available for SACS? And I can answer that per vendor. Uh, there are uh, learning resources. You can go to learn.bentley.com and search for SACS, and there's some quick start guides and other learning material there. And you can also go to the Bentley Communities Wiki page. Uh, and while they're not really tutorials, there are, is some information in there uh, regarding different workflows for particular things and little tips and tricks. Uh, it's another good place to get resources for SACS. Let's see. Usually the platform is exposed to several different sea states during the year. For example, each season. How is the how is it that you can perform a time domain analysis uh, specifically when you're only doing an analysis for three hours? The time domain analysis basically uh, you would expect that if you know the duration for each season, in other words you know this wave, uh, you're going to get a wave coming from uh, a given direction for say you're using three hours, but you know the actual duration, what you can do is say the number of occurrences of that time history is going to be the time, the overall time divided by what, whatever you have for your time history duration. And basically that's how we calculate the number of occurrences over the whole duration. Not sure if I made that right or clear. Right. The way I like to think about it is that the three hours or whatever time that you analyze it is just supposed to represent a, the right. period itself. So you factor it up and you can do multiple fatigue environments in your analysis. So you can do a three hour period for each season and then just factor those occurrences up to match however occur, long yes. you think that will occur. Let's see. Uh, can you display fatigue lives graphically in version 10? Fatigue lives, I think we can. Uh, in the I, th I think that's in the, what he's talking about is the in oh, in interactive, interactive fatigue, fatigue. You can show the fatigue lives in there, and can we not also plot them in post view as well? So. Well, th that's what I'm saying, the, the new interactive yes, we can. post view. Yes, we can, basically. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, can SACS calculate plate fatigue? Which fatigue? Plate fatigue, yes. Plate. Uh, it can. In other words, uh, I really had a, have an example that you haven't shown that if you wanted to, if you, if, if you didn't have too many jobs, you want to look at. In other words, you can actually mesh a joint in a structure and run a full fatigue analysis, and then you can look at fatigue plate, uh, plate fatigue instead of having to extract the SCF. Apply it to a beam model if you wanted to do that. And, uh, work directly on the plates, but of course you need to look at the fatigue uh, damage at a given location away from the root of the weld. Right, you can you get large stresses right at the joint between yeah. two uh, plates. Assume, yes, you're, it's assumed that you're going to get a singularity there, so you have to look away uh, at a given distance from the root of the well, basically. Too. And and there's guidance in um, in like various codes uh, like DNB on how to uh, how to Correct. evaluate that. Okay. Like I said, uh, going forward with the 12.0 release, we will be doing that automatically for you. In other words, you will run a, a stress analysis on a, a mesh joint, and we will extrapolate the stresses to give you a stress concentration factor as per, say, code such as a DNB code. And then we will also give you the plots around the footprint of each member coming into the joints and we'll give you the stresses uh, or the SCF stress concentrations uh, around the footprint. So that's coming up with the 12.0 release. 
All right, we've got lots of questions coming in, Parvinder, so I'm going to start <laughs> hurrying a little. Uh, is fatigue damage determined by a time history comparable to a spectral analysis? If you run the time history long enough, you should get uh, an equivalent fatigue damage. Uh, as per, I don't know if you heard of something called the Monte Carlo method, where you run the time history for the longer you run it, the better your answers, and the, the, the two should coincide. Assuming they are representing the Correct. same environment. Right. Um, which version of PostView were you showing, Parvinder? The one that I was showing was, I think it may have been 10.0. Uh, yeah. I think it was 10. Yeah, 11 should be very similar in, in style, though. Um, see, how can I declare in an analysis the different safety factors to determine life by fatigue, depending on whether they are inspectable, inspectable or if they are with catastrophic failure? It's the, the joint uh, severity. Right. How, how would you determine the safety life factors? Uh, difficult. I think right now, I think we put in an overall safety factor, but I'm not sure whether we, I think we may actually allow safety factor per joint now as well in fatigue, I've, but I would have to check that. I think we may have put that in after, I think it was uh, supplement two uh, that came out that actually required particular joints to be uh, determined as critical joints. There is a safety factor override in the joint override line, so you can you can right. specify the safety factor by joint. Per joint, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. See, do we need to consider effective joint thickness in fatigue analysis? Only if you are you have a grouted um, leg or something like that. In other words, if you have a pile within the leg and the annulus around it is grouted, then there are various options and including the option that's recommended by API for considering a effective thickness, yes. Um, let's see, it says, uh, can you please provide a link to, to review this webinar? Uh, Muj, I don't know, or we can, we'll have a survey after. Yes, I think yep. we do okay. provide yeah, that. There will be a link after the presentation to, to review the, the webinar. Let's see. It says, I'm going to skip that one for now. Um, you mentioned about time history fatigue for WinFarm. How are the results compared to other software such as SESAM? I do not know if SESAM has ever been used on any wind farm project. I don't believe it has. Uh, I don't, so I wouldn't be able to comment on the results from that. Uh, I, I do know, recall in the way, way back where, uh, maybe this is, uh, the fatigue, some people have compared the fatigue results from both products and they are, well, they have to be very similar. But I, I really don't know much about the wind turbine application in SESAM, uh, in that it hasn't really been used on any project so far whatsoever. What would be a rec... Oh, sorry, look, go ahead, Parvinder. So, yeah, so when you look at the SACS wind turbine application, you'll find that it's been used now on multiple wind farms designing uh, some very, very large wind farms. So it's been used, it's been tried, it's been tested. It's been independently verified uh, by a number of contractors. So it's, uh, but I, I, like I sort of said, I, I don't know much about SESAM. Other than that, I, I, don't, I don't know of any project where it's been used. Let's see, uh, what would be the recommended value for an upper limit SCF value? I think by default we put in a value of five in there. If we don't know what the SEF is, uh, I really 
don't know if there's a desired upper limit that that's recommended. Right. I would say that it's, you know, the upper limit is really more of a way to kind of bound your analysis so you don't get really high numbers if you are just kind of putting in, you know, maybe you have some tubular connections that are out of the limits or something like that. You don't want to get them too high. But, you know, SES can be, you know, they approach infinity if you have like a 90 degree turn. Uh, so uh, it's difficult to say, you know, what, you know, what should be the upper limit. Uh, I think if that's a question, uh, looking at doing an actual mesh and doing an FEA analysis for the joint is worth considering. Uh, those upper and lower limits, I think, are really more geared towards getting initial estimates of SCFs. See, uh, the meshing for auto SCF calculation had triangular plates. Is that okay? Right. Uh, I know a lot of people recommend that you should use quadrilater quadrilateral plates now. Uh, first of all, what we did was internally we conducted many sort of uh, internal investigations, we found that uh, if you say, for example, four triangular elements uh, for, uh, for a quadrilateral, both, both basically give you the same answers. Uh, right, and triangular plates are sometimes necessary on curved surfaces to get a better representation of the... Correct, of and that was the second thing, was where you have intersections between curved surfaces. If you use a quadrilateral element there, it's very difficult to maintain the four joints uh, to be in the same plane. And you get non-coplanarity issues uh, many times, and so therefore I, it's... If you have a triangular uh, element, the three joints are always in the same plane, and you never get that issue. And non-coplanarity actually uh, introduces errors in your uh, finite element results. It, it gets away from that. OK, I have a question here saying, can you show me a table on page 13? I'm going to say that um, let's, uh, if you have, if you want to go see that, uh, there should be a recording of this presentation that you'll be able to see later on. Uh, so in interest of time, we, we, let's not go back to the presentation. Um, let's see. Will so, SACS automatically select the SN curve based on the type of joint? Right. I mean, uh, not the SN curve. I mean, the SN curve, you can def use it defines the SN curve. It, will adjust the SCF on the type of joint, in other words, the load path dependency on of that joint. But the actual SN curve is user-defined. And, and you can define different SN curves for different joints uh, using an override. Right, and it should be noted that SN curves are independent of joint type. Right. It's, right. yeah. Just the but if you, if you wanted to use a different SN curve, for I mean, we give you all that flexibility. Uh, Jeff is right. The joint type, meaning uh, the load path dependency, SN curves are independent of that load path dependency. When you use a different SF, SCF theory, you get different results. Why? March, uh, mildly. Uh, <laughs> Fatigue, in a way, is a black art. So that's why I think API and all the codes have standardized on a uh, same approach. In other words, use the TEMU SCFs. We've found if you use interactive fatigue that if you use a jump from one SCF to the other one, you can jump from uh, you know a fatigue life of one year to 50 years. It, it's just the way the SCFs are calculated. Some are based upon model uh, epoxy models, and some are based upon FE theory. So uh, there is no standardization in the different approaches. Right. The the original researchers that developed those uh, equations were extrapolating from a series of tests that they did. Yes, so results, it's a, yeah. It, it, when you extrapolate like that, you can end up with uh, 
two points that go to different places <laughs> um, on your curve. So that's that's why you get different results with the SCFs. But I believe FMU is pretty much widely accepted as the the SCF theory to use for two. Correct. Now. API, uh, ISO, uh, NORSOC, they all recommend FMU now. So it's the standard approach. Okay. Uh, somebody was asking, are there any tutorials or guidelines on this new technique? I'm assuming the new technique is using the joint mesher. I can answer that. The um, I mentioned earlier, go to learn.bentley.com. There is a special interest group presentation on using the joint mesher. So uh, you can go there and watch that. It's a small, a short presentation on the joint mesher and how to how to use the plate uh, plate modeling. Uh, GUI, so you can look there for some more in-depth uh, tutorial on that. Let's see, when you model joints using detailed joint mesh, what loading is used for calculating the SCFs? Usually, you would uh, apply what well, unit loads, uh, the ends, so one in uh, turn after turn on each. Uh, race basically. So you could do the same but have that joint in situ in the total model. In other words, you can apply those loads at the connection joints between the free model and the member the member itself. Basically. So you you can go ahead and do that. Right. I mean the easiest way I think to think about it is you're trying to model the nominal load, right? So you would fix everything and you put a nominal load on one of the braces, that'll give you the SCF for, to, that corresponds to that nominal load. And it can be a unit load or, you know, right. something, but you'll end up with the stress concentration factor based on that nominal load. Okay. Um, is there any way to import uh, produced interactive fatigue matrices from FE software, such as, uh, or sorry, IF matrices from FE software, such as ANSYS to SACS, if we wa don't want to use the mesh in SACS? No. Seriously. No. I, and I would go so far as to say, I, I don't know if you would want to do that, because the whole point of doing this is to, if, well, the main reason for doing this is to generate SCFs, right? So if you're going to the trouble of already modeling it in ANSYS, uh, you can easily get the SCF there and then apply that in SEX. So you've already done the hard part. <laughs> yes. Let's see. Uh, Somebody says, when do we choose time domain or frequency domain? Depends on what information you get from your in you know your MetOcean data. Do you get a time history profile, or do you get a uh, wave spectrum as your MetOcean criteria? Yeah, right? in, in in general, if you have a compliant type of a structure with a very long period, it's customary to use time history analysis for that. Right. If you have some um, dynamic. Yeah, yeah, for non-compliant type of structures like uh, such as a jacket with a not so large period, it's fairly common to use spectral. And in areas where you don't have any spectral data, people will revert to deterministic. But I don't see much deterministic fatigue being conducted these days. All right. Um, somebody asked, can you consider local joint stiffness in SACS? Yes, you can, and there are various approaches available. Uh, I think there are three approaches available in SACS. Uh, there's the MSL, there's the Rock, Fessler. Three are available, yes. Okay, and I think that's uh, enough, as much time as we have. I know there were a lot more questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, if you uh, still are interested in getting those questions answered, I recommend going to Bentley Communities. You can go to communities.bentley.com and go ask them there, post them there, and we'll uh, get to them there. 
Um, but I'm going to hand it back over to Muj to close this out. Clavinda, thanks for a great presentation and a big thank you to all of you for your questions and participation.